Namaste. You're listening to the Savana Podcast. Join us on an exploration of Eastern spirituality, yoga philosophy, and conscious living for the new age. This podcast is a production of SavanaSpirit.com, the best place to shop for unique clothing, spiritual handcrafted jewelry, healing gemstones, and fair trade gifts from the Far East. Now, here's your host, Brett Larkin. Hello, Savannah family. In this episode, I'm going to be giving you all my tips on how to have the most amazing Shavasana of your life. Shavasana is the one yoga pose that you do in every single yoga class. And if you've listened to some of the past episodes that we have here on the show with incredible restorative yoga experts like Judith Hansen Lassiter, the new news is that we need to be doing Shavasana more often. Beyond yoga class, we need to be incorporating it into our daily routine to just re recharge our batteries and deal with the stress of living in the information age. Before I dive into all of these tips, I want to remind you of how you can support the show and the biggest way is really simple. It's to make a purchase at savannaspirit.com. Right now, I am featuring their crystal cleansing smudge set. One of the best things to do in Shavasana is to smudge before you lie down. Just have that really amazing aroma, whether it's in your home or in the studio and their smudge set comes with a beautiful shell. It comes with two white sage bundles, an amethyst pocket stone. It's one of the best sellers of their whole website. It also has black sand. So a lot of just the really lovely details you need to make smudging a really nice ritual. Part of your regular practice is in this kit. And remember, you can use that coupon code TAKE25 for $25 off anything in your cart at savannaspirit.com. So go check that out. And now let's dive into talking about Shavasana. So the first tip I have for you is to do Shavasana more often and to do it for longer. I just went to a yoga class earlier today where probably a good four or five people left the class before Shavasana even started. And the teacher only had, you know, five minutes or so to allot to Shavasana. So really a studio class It's rare, I think, that it's going to give you the Shavasana that you really need and deserve. And that's just the way it is, right? And one of the best things you can do that was a huge tip that was in Judith Hanson Lasseter's episode from earlier in this podcast season is she suggested taking a Shavasana every afternoon, whether it's two o'clock, three o'clock, four o'clock, that time where you just start to get tired. Or if you work at an office, as soon as you get home from work, maybe at five or six, take 20 minutes to lie down in your bed. And that's right, I said 20 minutes because that's how long Shavasana actually needs to be. Now, my big breakthrough that I had around Shavasana was that I was doing Shavasana just lying on my yoga mat. Maybe that's how you're doing it too. But turns out, after all the experts that I've interviewed on this show, lots of experimentation and just, you know, my own direct experience, what I found is that lying on your mat for Shavasana is doing you a huge disservice. Shavasana is so important because it's the time in your yoga practice or that break in your day where you're absorbing all the benefits of what came before. So in a yoga context, if you did a really heating, powerful class, or maybe a really detoxifying kundalini kriya, whatever it is that came before is going to have a more profound effect on your body, your prana, your psyche, your aura. If you allow the intelligence of the prana to really go where it needs to go in the body, and that happens during rest, during shavasana. So you're going to integrate whatever work you're doing so much more deeper, like on this deeper level, if you take the longer Shavasana. So Shavasana is not a waste of time. It's actually adding more bang to your buck in terms of really getting the most benefit out of your yoga practice. And if you're doing Shavasana as part of your daily routine at home, it's really going to recharge and revitalize you for the next part of your day. I currently live with a nine month old and he takes three to four naps a day and he's super, super happy. We're a lot older than nine months, but we still need to rest to get up at six or seven like most of us do and perhaps not go to bed until 9, 10, 11 p.m. is just too long, even for an adult to not have a time out or some sort of break. Now, Shavasana means you are not asleep, you are aware, but you're just resting. And this is a state that is uncomfortable for many of us because we're just used to being on the go, 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 or we're used to being passed out, zonked out asleep. So it can be uncomfortable for people to just 
lie in Shavasana and often uncomfortable for me and maybe uncomfortable for you because you're lying there and you just start thinking about your to-do list or your mind's kind of wandering. But here's my first big tip for you is to embrace the wander, right? Recently, it came up in my private membership community, Uplifted. A really amazing member who's been a member of this community for years shared that she's been having a really hard time both in Shavasana and her meditation practice being present, meaning she was having a really hard time letting her thoughts go. And this community is so amazing. I mean, her beautiful share had like 30 incredible, insightful comments from yoga teachers and dedicated yoga students all around the world. I mean, like really insightful comments. But one of the big things I took away reading the thread and that then I added on and shared was that it's very natural for your mind not to be still right away when you're practicing shavasana, restorative, or meditation. And instead of fighting that, a lot of times what I personally do is I just let my thoughts wander and let myself daydream and know that eventually that will stop. And then that silence and awareness and sort of deeper sense of presence that we're all craving will naturally kind of bubble up to the surface. But think about it. How often do you really let yourself just think or daydream? You maybe feel like you're thinking all the time in your head, but I'm talking about like just daydreaming. How often do you just let yourself sort of think, right? Like I often don't ever give myself time to do this unless I'm like on a long car ride, for example, or maybe if you're traveling in a plane or a train and you kind of have this time where there's no Wi-Fi and no text messaging and you're just sort of letting your mind be expansive and letting those subconscious thoughts that want to bubble up, bubble up. So instead of fighting the thoughts, I think just give them time, let them go. And at a certain point, you won't, your, your mind won't have more to say. Or you'll, you'll notice it starting to sort of like loop back things that you've already thought about. So know that that's a very natural, natural part of the relaxation process. And you can sort of enjoy seeing what's on your current top 10 list of thoughts. And I know a lot of times when I sit down now for my shavasana or lie down rather, I, I, I sort of experience and almost look forward to like, hey, what's going on behind what's going on in my mind? What am I going to kind of end up thinking about for the first five minutes? And this is, again, why the relaxation experience should be 20 minutes, why you need that chunk of time so badly. Because for a lot of us, that first three, five, 10, or even 15 minutes of meditation or shavasana might just be the discharge of, of the thoughts that are currently kind of running around in the mind space. Now let's give some more practical physical tips because I've had huge breakthroughs here and I want to share it with all of you. So like I said earlier, just lying down on your yoga mat, I always thought was great. Like you can't do Shavasana wrong. You just lie there. But now that I've gone deeper, I've realized that you need to have all your joints in flexion in order to truly relax in Shavasana. And what does that mean? I go over flexion and extension really in a lot of detail in my online teacher training, but to just make it very simple for right now, Flexion, we're going to say, just means that all the major joints in your body are bent. So that would mean that your knees are bent, your elbows are bent, and then I'm going to say also your chin is a little bit dipped into the chest instead of your head and neck being in extension, kind of thrusting backwards. What this means is that everyone, if you want to have flexion in the knees during Shavasana, everyone needs a bolster under their knees for Shavasana. Now, if you're like me, you've probably heard a yoga teacher say, if you want me to bring a bolster, raise your hand, or I'd suggest using a bolster under the knees, something like that, and you kind of never do it. I am going to tell you, it is a game changer. It's a game changer because it's going to release tension in your low back. And it's, again, just having something about having the joints in flexion is going to allow for such a deeper sense of relaxation. So that's my first big tip. Get your knees in flexion, meaning get something under your knees so they're bent in your shavasana. And if you don't have a bolster available, no big deal roll up a blanket or my other favorite hack for if you're at a yoga studio that doesn't have bolsters or you're kind of making do with what you have at home is to take two yoga blocks, put two yoga blocks like set up like as if one's going to go under Beneath each knee, and then take a blanket, fold it a couple times, and put it on top of the two blocks. And that can be like a makeshift bolster, and it works incredibly well. So that's 
my first big physical tip. Knees have got to be in flexion. And then let's go to the top of the body now and talk about the chin and how we get the cervical spine in just a tiny bit of flexion. Not extreme, but a little bit. And for that, you need to have a blanket underneath your head. Not a high blanket, just a little something. So just like a yoga type blanket folded over once or maybe a towel folded over twice in your home. And one of the things you can do that I really love is to just kind of squeeze the blanket at the bottom so it scrunches up just a tiny bit or fold it over one extra time at the bottom and then have that kind of higher, chunkier part of the blanket go right at your cervical spine. So if you take your hand to the back of your neck right now, right below your hairline, you'll sort of see that it sort of uh, dips in, right? The cervical spine is naturally in a lordotic curve. So you want to fill up that space between those, you know, gentle little vertebra in your neck and the floor by kind of rolling that blanket maybe a little bit extra to have a tiny bit of extra support below the occiput. So again, just think below your hairline and where your shoulders begin. This is going to be a game changer. A, for your neck and B, because all of a sudden the back of your head is no longer resting on the hard mat. I mean, even the most cushiony mats are kind of hard. So having that layer of blanket is going to be amazing. Okay, now let's talk about flexion in the mid part of the body with the elbows. I was always taught to do Shavasana with my arms out long, uh, so kind of straight alongside my body. And you know, if that's working for you, please don't change anything on my account. However, as someone who's been heavily experimenting with Shavasana for a couple months now, it has been a game changer for me to bend my elbows and put one hand on the heart and one hand on the belly, or sometimes to interlace both hands and place them around my bra line, just kind of at the above my navel and just relax like that. It helps my shoulder blades relax. And I don't know, there's just something amazing about not having the arms out long, but having them kind of a little bit closer to the body and getting that bend in the elbows, right? Again, that flexion at the elbow joint. These are all going to make a big difference. Now, the other things that are really required to have an amazing Shavasana, and remember, Shavasana is going to get you more bang for your buck. It's going to allow the intelligence of the pranic energy you've generated throughout whatever yoga practice to go where it needs to go. Or if you're resting after a busy work day, it's going to allow the healing to happen and for you to kind of uh, receive healing energy where you need to, f- where you need to receive it. The, the other two things that are essential are quiet and then warmth. And then another one is darkness, but we'll talk about that one last. So Let's dive in with warmth because that's one of the easiest ones to control. This is where I'd suggest always putting on socks for Shavasana. So this might just mean you need to change up how you kind of get into the yoga studio, right? Like bring your socks with you instead of leaving them maybe in your sneakers or with your shoes at the front of the studio. Be thinking ahead, right? And then I would also suggest that you bring a sweater or something warm or maybe a scarf into the studio and have that by your mat throughout the whole class as well because you can use that to sort of cover parts of your body or cover your head and face. Now, some yoga studios have eye pillows, and if they do, I highly recommend getting one and using it for your Shavasana. If you're worried about hygiene or anything like that, you can just grab a tissue, like most yoga studios also have a box of Kleenex. So just put the Kleenex between your eyes and the uh, pillow that the studio provides. And if they don't have an eye pillow, just use your shirt to black out your eyes because that's gonna get the darkness factor. You also may just want to put on that sweater. So if I know I'm taking class or going to be in an especially cold studio, I bring in and have right by my mat, my socks, (laughs) my shirt, like a a long sleeve shirt that I'll put on for Shavasana. And then also something else as well. Ideally like a scarf or maybe another additional layer that I can use to put over my eyes to get that third quality we were talking about that's so important, the darkness, the blackout. It is so extra healing to have that darkness. And again, the the eye pillow that actually puts weight on the optic nerve is even better because it's, you know, even when your eyes are closed, your, your eyes are still aware of light that's going on in the space around you, even once they're shut. So even though your eyes are closed inside, the the optic nerve has not shut off. Inside your closed eyes, your eyeballs are still moving around, even if you're not aware of it. So when you really make it pitch black, that's when that optic nerve can finally just completely take a day off and rest 
and relax. And if you have restless eye syndrome, which I have, it means even when you close your eyes, they flutter slightly. And that means a weighted eye pillow is going to be essential for you. So we have all the joints in flexion. We have some key props like a bolster, something under the knees, something over the face, something under the neck, and hopefully we're very warm. Another thing that has been a game changer for me is putting sandbags on my pelvis and my belly, really weighting myself down. So if you have vata in your uh, constitution, like I do, and vata is very common, especially in this day and age, but vata represents that wind, uh, air, ether element in, in the body. So People who have high vata are incredibly creative and fast thinkers and accomplish so much, but they have a hard time slowing down and grounding into their body and getting present. So if that sounds at all like you, having a weighted sandbag on your body can create so much healing and making it part of your Shavasana practice is so easy because you just throw throw the sandbag gently uh, on top of your hips. And what I found is that one sandbag isn't enough. So I actually put one sandbag running from my left hip to my right hip, and then I put another sand- sandbag just above that, so right around my navel space. And this really weighs down and helps me get super grounded. And it also helps my low back sort of traction more towards the floor, especially because I have my knees now in flexion, knees are elevated. So I have no lower back discomfort at all. And, you know, I'm kind of slightly back on the back part of my glutes when I'm lying down instead of my low back being arched off the floor. And this is the exact position you want to be in order to really, really deeply relax. Other things that you can do, and this is probably my favorite hack of all because it's so easy and you can't do it so much in the yoga studio, but you could do it in a home practice or if you're taking Shavasana at home or taking a Shavasana break as part of your day, maybe lying in your bed, is to use a heating pad. Now, I had never owned a heating pad or even known that much about them until I had a baby. And my midwife had told me that the heating pad was really an essential item that we needed for our newborn. And it turned out to be one of the best tips we got. We used that heating pad to keep him warm when he was first born. We put the heating pad on his changing table so he wouldn't be startled when we had to change his diaper on the cold changing table. We'd use the heating pad to preheat his bassinet. You know, newborns are so sensitive. So I felt like kind of treating him like a VIP and preheating like every surface that he needed to go on really made his first few hours and days of life a lot smoother. So we were using it a ton when my son was, you know, just a month old, two months old. And then this heating pad kind of just got lost in our bedroom until I one day I rediscovered it and thought, hmm, I wonder what it would be like if I turned on this heating pad all the way to high and like just lied down on it to take my Shavasana, like added it into my Shavasana resting ritual. And let me tell you, once I started doing it, I was almost angry that no one had told me about this and that I hadn't been doing it my whole life. So I'm telling you, a heating pad is so easy. You can get a heating pad at like Target or Walgreens or Walmart for less than 20 bucks and you just plug it in, turn it on. It heats up super fast. I like to put mine right at my low back and now I use it for everything for myself. Like I preheat my bed before I get in it and I'm always using it now as part of Shavasana and I just love it. Because remember to really create that ultimate Shavasana environment, we want quiet, dark, and warm. And what could be better than a heating pad to make you warm? Now adding on to the warmth, covering the whole body with a blanket is great. And even covering your whole head with a blanket, if that feels comfortable for you. Now that can be really hard to accomplish on your own, right? That's why it's really lovely when a teacher kind of does it for you in yoga class. But that's another thing that I would definitely encourage you to do. And maybe it means you need to buy some extra yoga blankets. I know I have three, call me crazy, but you know, you need the the neck one, one to cover your whole body. And you know, maybe you just also need one uh, because you're using it like under the knees or somewhere else for support. So if you can get the whole body covered or if you're doing Shavasana in your bed, get under the covers, but remember have that bolster. Uh, That's really gonna add to that sense of warmth. And then my last two tips just have to do with noise and scent, right? Sort of the senses we haven't covered yet. So the quieter it is for your Shavasana, the better. And 
I know it's controversial, you know, whether to play music or not in yoga. I think I have a YouTube video about that. And, you know, Shavasana, is it better to have music or no music? But I am going to invite or encourage you to just have Shavasana in silence. Just do silence. How often in our day do we get to experience silence? So if silence is available to you, I encourage you to take it. If it's not available, meaning that your house or your environment or wherever you are is loud, I would suggest earplugs. And I would also suggest, you know, if you have those AirPods or any kind of headset, just put on some background music that's really relaxing, maybe like a singing bowl track that you could find on YouTube, something that's just going to let you zone out and also help block out any ambient noise in your home or environment. Make sure that if you're listening to something on YouTube or on your phone that you put it on airplane mode. That is very important. And lastly, smell. Smell is incredibly powerful. So this is where a little bit of essential oil or using the sage that I mentioned at the beginning of this episode is going to have a huge effect like 10x return on your Shavasana time. So see if you can get a little bit of scent in the mix as well. And if you start doing even just a couple of the things that I mentioned in this episode, your Shavasanas are going to feel completely different. If you've dreaded Shavasana in the past, I think it could open up a whole new relationship for you. And I know for me, I never disliked Shavasana, but it was never really this relationship or pose I was insanely excited about and I am now in love. So I hope all the ideas that I've shared in here can inspire you to make your next Shavasana more amazing. I would now love to hear from you and connect with you. So there's a couple ways to do that. First of all, the private Facebook group that Savannah Spirit has is savannaspirit.com forward slash group. That's going to redirect you. You can get approved as a member and you can always DM or find me on Instagram at Larkin Yoga TV. And you can also find me on YouTube where I teach totally free yoga and meditation. I would love to support you in your quest for the perfect Shavasana. So let me know what you thought of this episode. A rating or review here on iTunes means the world to me. So if you haven't taken the time to do that yet, you can go to savannaspirit.com forward slash review and there's step-by-step instructions on how you can leave a review on this podcast because I know it's tricky to do from your phone. Please take some time to rest today. Please consider a 20-minute shavasana at some point in your routine, whether it's today or tomorrow, and know that I'm sending you so much love. From my heart to yours, namaste. You've been listening to the Savannah Podcast. To find out more about Savannah, go to savannahspirit.com or follow Savannah on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Savannah Spirit. For daily inspiration, check out our blog at savannaheast.com. Be sure to join us next week for a new episode. And thank you for listening to the Savannah Podcast.